here on 365 Sports. So here's the list of college football teams. There's, this is such a common denominator. It makes so much sense that these are the ones. What basically is the common denominator of these five schools other than, of course, what was unbeaten Florida State who was left out? Well, it's the teams that uh, were in the college football playoff or mm -hmm. should have been in the college football playoff. And they had the most players drafted in the NFL draft. And But you're right. Everybody but Florida State who was left out because of the semifinals. And there they are, the rich and why they were good. And there's the reason why. And they'll all end up with a lot of players, not quite that many, maybe, uh, drafted next year. Well, I think uh, you saw with the totals and the way the configuration is going to be next year that this is, like I said last week, all these graphics that are like, the Big Ten's got the most this since here and the SEC's got the most this since here. We're just going to hear that every single year from here on out because now they have more teams than they've ever had. And, for example, if you look at what the Pac-12 did – and you go cut up their numbers and say, all right, well, let's take Washington's and let's take Oregon's and let's take UCLA's and let's take USC's. And I know in some cases, you know, some of these schools didn't make as much of a dent as the others, but you're looking at the Big Ten going from whatever their total was to adding about 20 players. Um, you're looking at the SEC, whatever their total was, mm -hmm. 11 with Texas and a down year for Oklahoma with three. That's 14 new players they're going to have on their list. So what was already a – a bit of a, a gap, you know, in some cases uh, that could be, you know, fought well like the Pac-12 did this year in their final year, their swan song. They had a great uh, going out party, uh, especially with the draft and just all the selections in the first round and beyond. Um, but now that gets divvied up. That cuts up and gets cut up and sliced, and some of that's going to the Big 12, um, but a lot of that's going to the Big 10. So, yeah, I think that the power programs um, – just in general are always going to be on the top of, of most of these lists that's why it kind of gets that's why I get tired of it in some ways because it's like we're we're not tired of it and I don't want to talk about it because I do think this year it's interesting with all of the conference moving and how that's going to change but sometimes it almost feels like cheerleading the same people over and over again you're like the whole system set up so it just feels like gross kind of you know what I mean to like keep self-congratulating some of those schools no not yeah. if you're part of them but I just know. on the on the observance side of it um, but it is fascinating how that is going to to grow and change and become even larger of a gap in some cases. Uh, you know, I think Arizona will have a better showing next year. There, there's a couple of players that could go first round for them. Colorado should be better next year. But in the grand scheme of things, you're looking at maybe the Big 12 adding like five to ten guys. Yeah. Um, but for the Big Ten, I mean, look at what Oregon and Washington and USC yeah. and, and I forget what the UCLA final number was. Few. But it was like 20 players. Yep. So. That's going to be, um, you know, definitely a part of this on the other side of next year where those draft totals are going to be almost uh, silly to talk about because there's going to be two so far out in yeah. front. I don't have the list in front of me, Paul or Craig, but Texas, remember, for the longest time went through a disappointing stretch. And 14, I, I don't know, they had a handful. Maybe it was they had nobody. Then, of course, a couple of years ago, nobody. But one of the things that have they've been pounded for, one, is not enough players getting drafted, but also not developing their players there's a chunk of those 11. Now, three of them were transfers, including uh, A.D. Mitchell, among others. But uh, they had a lot of players who were drafted that also were not the highly ranked five-star guys. And so that is something that Sarkeesian and his staff are doing. I think seven of the 11 were recruited by Tom Herman. And then Sarkeesian was able to mold them, and now they're stacking the cupboard every year. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, by the way, uh, every other conference is going to get what it feels like to be a libertarian or the Green Party or whatever uh, when it comes to the draft because they're just going to be like, oh, well, it's the Big Ten and the SEC. Mm -hmm. It's very much like mm -hmm. the Democrats and Republicans. If, you, if you're a third-party candidate here, it's going to be – um, you know, you're kind of in the wilderness. Yeah, no, I mean, it really will be. And that's fine. Like, you know, I've, I've tried to kind of make it a point to throw it in there, you know, here lately of not everything has to be a conference bragging rights Absolutely. thing. Like every single thing that we talk about, it almost uh, gets beaten to death. But uh, yeah, there was a, a nice showing by Texas, certainly Michigan, as you saw, like all those top teams, you know, we're, uh, we're sitting here in Waco. They had no draft picks, uh, Dave Aranda and company. And I had somebody ask me, is like, is that alarming? And I'm like, not necessarily this year because they had like maybe two guys who had even a, a sniff of a chance to get drafted. So that's fine. But then when you take into account that's one guy total in two years 
and then they're losing, and you look at those programs, and are any of those losing programs? No. Winning means drafting guys getting drafted. And so from that standpoint, yeah, if you're not getting guys drafted, um, I do think that can become a red flag. I think it is on the verge of becoming that for Baylor, but I also don't think Dave Aranda, if they don't win games next year, is going to be around to even have a – a total on next year's draft, right? I mean, mm-hmm. like, he'll be the coach of whoever gets drafted, but um, that's not going to be like the – his fate will be determined by the time the next year's draft rolls around, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But uh, winning and all of these other things that come with it, they go hand in hand. And and so you see with the draft, I mean, that's the top five teams in the country last year. And sure enough, there they are on top of the, the draft board. So I think when all was said and done, and this is a – also, I think alarming just in general, just looking at drafts moving forward, alarming not necessarily a, a big red, fl- a big like bad thing, but uh, you had the SEC, if, if I think this is right, had 59 players drafted. That was the most, <clears throat> I think they've had the most like 18 years. Pac-12 actually had the uh, second most in their final year. They had 44. The Big Ten had 43. The Big 12 had, uh, excuse me, ACC had 41. The Big 12 pulling up the rear at 31. Pulling up the rear of the major conferences. The, the plus Power the, Five. It used to be the Power Five, yeah. That's now not going to ever, is not going to exist as a Power Five anymore. So, yeah, in the last year, they pulled up the rear by uh, a good 10 picks. But, yeah, you add uh, 14 from the Big 12 to the SEC, and that puts them at, like, 17 and I think they'd get like six or so from the schools coming in so like I said at the very start those gaps are going to widen even more with just the movement of teams Um, and for the everyone else and the rest of the colleges I mean that's an incredibly small number when you start to look at it when you take into account the non-power four and I think that kind of getting my overall point is also the transfer portal coming into play and and NIL and things like that so yeah it's going to get to the point where it's uh, or it's at the point now where it's maybe as lopsided as ever. I think starting next year, when you look at just the conferences involved and who's getting picked uh, because of all the the various reasons that I mentioned. No, there, you're no, no question. Uh, three of the transfers among the eleven that were drafted uh, for Texas, uh, they had was it uh, Robinson, the running back, uh, came from Alabama. Uh, Ryan Watts uh, was it right. No, A.D. Mitchell from Georgia was also another one, and then also Watts. Uh, so those were players that were uh, transfers among the 11, but the three-star players they developed that were on the campus, Jalen Ford, I mentioned earlier. I think uh, even Jonathan Brooks was just shy of a four-star. To Devondre Sweat, Byron Murphy, among some others. Well, now, it was fun to see Tom Herman get some credit. No, yeah. uh, and then also people push back on the credit he actually deserved. I mean, the guy obviously had an eye for talent, but it was the rest of it. So you give Sark a lot of credit for development and what he's done over the last couple of years. And, um, again, when you're you're winning, everything seems to be going right. And they won big this year, and they've got a lot of momentum. And now they've got the draft uh, monkey off their back as far as you know kind of being poked at and not being able to develop or some years not having guys and now they're they're right back in the thick of things here are the high schools in texas who had a player drafted now on that list there's a couple of young schools or young they're temple on the second column fourth down midway fourth column farthest down among a couple of others craig your alma mater tyler legacy right there in the middle used to be lee those are the schools uh, players were drafted. And the number is uh, making it to the NFL was 0.07 or 0.7% of the high schools in Texas had a player drafted. And those are the ones from the state of Texas. Now, Florida had theirs. Georgia had theirs. But I wanted to put up a couple because a couple of those guys' teams are in our backyard, plus Craig's alma mater uh, with Tyler Legacy, too. Uh, yeah. yeah, Bo Limmer from uh, Arkansas yep. got drafted yep. from Absolutely. Legacy. So, yeah, good for him. And obviously we cover Midway, so good for Katori Leviston uh, getting his shot in the later rounds. I know Tanner Mordecai got – He's going to be in studio here at 525. Tanner Mordecai got uh, got a shot as well. So, yeah, good for those guys. Wow, shocker. Duncanville DeSoto had yeah. guys drafted. Oh, yeah. yeah, shocker. Wow, I mean, yeah. like a good for upstart programs Alito. like Alito. They've won like 12, 12 state titles. And Ryan, Jatavian Standers, and, among others. And, yeah, and, and Lufkin. Yeah. Just uh, just, just, <laughs> just balling. Yeah. Uh, Garrett, let's move the five-star. Let's move the quarterback issue to later in the – not issue. Next year's potential – Picks from the quarterback class of 2025. We'll do that for uh, later in the show. So UAB football, Trent Dilfer 
He, uh, he's going all in to try to help his team. I wanted to make sure I helped uh, pour gasoline on something that's going to happen no matter what. I might as well use my influence to help, happen, uh, help it happen faster on behalf of our players. The UAB football team has signed up with athletes.org, making them the first actual team, Division I, to publicly join a players association. This is one. I guess it's part of revenue sharing. Yeah. This doesn't mean they're going to immediately start – negotiating with UAB administration, but this was a story that came in about mid-afternoon earlier today. Yeah, um, this will maybe help, um, you know, grow that and, and speed it along. The, to get revenue sharing and to get it right, they're going to have to um, f have a, at least a consensus as a group to negotiate on their behalf, or they're just going to have to say something that they know everybody's going to agree to. Uh, and I don't have the faith that that second part would happen. You know, they're going to say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you guys 7% of the revenue. And they're going to go, well, why not 8 or 10 or 12? But if you don't have a central, there's no union yet, so there's no central negotiating body on behalf of the players. It, I don't know. Like, again, I don't know how you get – Revenue sharing done without a union or a representation. So if it's going to happen, they might as well, like, you know, keep getting people on board. I think players get just over 50% of the NFL, right? Of course, a different deal, professional mm -hmm. league, the union and the ownership with billions of dollars that they share. And I think the players get just over about 50 to 51%. I mean, uh, the word union has been thrown around quite a bit here over the last couple of years, especially in regards to what the future may look like. And so, yeah, I guess this is a – a step towards that uh, for UAB at least. And, you know, big picture, I, I don't know how all that looks or shapes up. I also don't know what kind of bargaining power some of these schools think they're going to have. Like, I think if it's this Ohio State, that's far more notable than mm -hmm. UAB because how much money is really coming UAB's way? And I don't say that disrespectfully. It's just I, I don't think every organization and every school that has people come together is necessarily going to have – anything to eat at the table because there is no food. You know what I mean? So uh, what can you get in the way of health services or um, I saw it mentioned in there like mental health or just re regular medical care and things like that um, as opposed to this idea that this is all going to lead to like big money sharing. But um, I'm very interested in how all of that shapes up. It's obviously going to be different for the bigger schools and for the smaller schools. But uh, the unionization part, I don't think comes as a surprise. We've seen some of this – you know, down um, down and away from the larger school. So does it trickle up? Um, it seems like it will eventually. But, yeah, I don't know what all that looks like. And it's, uh, it's an interesting step, but um, a lot of unanswered questions about all of this uh, as a whole, whether it's UAB or just unions and college players in general. All right, let's get to the transfer portal. Just to kind of summarize, Baylor had three visitors come in. They still have work to be done. This is Alinus Noel from... Paul, Texas Southern, mm -hmm. very highly thought of defensive lineman, a big dude in the middle. They need that. I saw Jim Nagy, among others, talking about him. He has committed. He's going to join us today at 4 o'clock. He'll have one year left. Let's go down the three who committed, then look back at what they might bring to the table. So he's from Texas Southern, a smaller school, but a player that was getting attention. Jaquez Evans from Western Kentucky. They now have Coach Cheney on the Baylor staff, the defensive staff. They've had a couple of from Western Kentucky. They get another one. He comes in. He's an edge rusher. They need help everywhere. Mm -hmm. And also a return portal. Lorenzo uh, uh, Lorando Johnson snacks. I'm back. I love his tweet. I was tripping, gang. My bad. I'm back. He went to Arkansas. He now is back with Baylor. What does this do, if anything? And we'll get to the other schools with some other names in a minute. Uh, I I like that they got more depth on the defensive line. Uh, snacks coming back is fine. Like you know, I. I I don't know how much of a difference it made last year with him being gone. I honestly don't because they just weren't good. I mean, they just weren't good in any facet. So I don't think any one player was going to make such a huge difference because they were bad up front on both sides. They've gotten better up front on defense. I'm not so sure that that's the case with offense. Uh, but so far defensively, and look, if they have to win games on defense this year, then that's what they're going to have to do. Um you know, and hope for the best on offense while they have a new system and a quarterback that can can make thing ha things happen and all that. But um, 
but yeah, I like I like all these moves. I mean, you know, Snacks coming back, I'm kind of indifferent about, but I think he's 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 a net positive overall. Yeah, I mean, they've needed help on defense since the offseason started. That was well known, and uh, this plugs a hole uh, at least partially on every level of the defense, whether it's. Noel on the uh, the defensive line or another Western Kentucky addition at linebacker. They hired Jamar Chaney, uh, who was coaching, helped coaching linebackers for uh, Western Kentucky. So it only makes sense that they've had a little bit of an influx of Western Kentucky guys in the back end uh, here since his arrival. So, yeah, another uh, another hilltopper uh, now part of this roster. And then um, in the back end, I mean, bringing back snacks. Uh, he had an okay year from what I could tell at Arkansas, but uh, he started his career here. He's familiar with the um, lay of the land. He's familiar with Aranda. And um, sometimes you got to leave to feel like uh, you need to come back again. And, and Baylor's obviously where, where he's meant to be more so than, than Arkansas because he's back for a second go round. So uh, they needed help in the secondary as well. I know it gets more detailed than that. I mean, as far as his role as a corner and what that looks like or how they use him and, and same trickling on down, like how do you use – um, you know, Noel up front and in particular, we'll learn all those details to come, but they needed help on every level and they've now got bodies on every level that they didn't have before yesterday. And these were guys who, in some cases, uh, like Noel, I know as a defensive lineman was being highly pursued by various teams. So that's a nice win for them. And yep. they certainly, after uh, not having really much lately to crow about, uh, have you know, yesterday to kind of rally the troops and get people excited. So I think it was important from that standpoint as well, just to keep the uh, the malaise away from the fan base because that that can creep up real quickly, um, especially when you're in the situation that they're in. So it was just nice, I think, for the program to have a little bit of excitement, a little bit of a jolt, and now they got to go and, and do something with it. NC State, Kentucky, K State, Arkansas, Maryland were just some of the schools that Noel was getting had gotten offers from. Colorado. Picks up a running back and a good one. Dylan Edwards from, excuse me, Kansas State picks up a running back and a good one. Dylan Edwards from Colorado. This was kind of the lean from the beginning. There were still thoughts there was a couple other schools. He now joins Avery Johnson, DJ Giddings, Giddings and others in that K-State backfield. Yeah, I, I, it's a huge pickup for Kansas State. It really makes their running game quite solid. Uh, Edwards also a really good receiver out of the backfield. So, which is lethal when you've got a quarterback who's going to roll out uh, and have kind of – and they're going to run as many RPOs as they will or just, you know – uh, Avery Johnson kind of making things up on the fly and having to bail out. Like, it's a really uh, interesting weapon for them to have uh, to go with DJ Giddens. Um, I I love the move for, for Kansas State to go get him. That's where he had committed there initially before he decided to go to Colorado. I know a lot of the Kansas State fans were mad, but uh, he scores that first touchdown. Uh, they'll forget about all the negative things they said about him. Yeah, I don't think they care now. He's yeah. there. I mean, they don't give a damn. He's a K-State Wildcat now, um, no matter what happens. But, yeah, I mean, um, it's an interesting portal story. You see this on occasion, uh, but it's just funny how it all works out. And a loss for Dion and the buff, certainly what was a huge win at the time to get Dylan Edwards is now – uh, another of just dozens of, of losses, it seems, that are piling up. Not necessarily losses in the big picture, but losses on the roster. Um, so, yeah, we'll see if he can now be that guy that he was recruited to be because we haven't really seen that yet. So uh, to picture him where it all kind of started and where he was uh, headed originally um, will be exciting, especially with all the, the – you know, reasons why you mentioned there, starting with Avery Johnson and just the offense that they run. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of reason for excitement of getting Dylan Edwards in that backfield and seeing what Chris Kleiman and uh, his staff can can do with all those weapons. So, yeah, that's, that's a good deal for the Wildcats. Scott Fritchen, who covers K-State, Dylan Edwards tells me, me and Avery on the same team, that's like Batman and Robin, you know. I bawled my eyes out because I was full of joy after we signed the papers to go play at Kansas State. Pretty Damn good weekend for Miami. Uh, I don't know how much of this. With Damian Martinez, the Oregon State running back, and also Samuel Brown, wide receiver from the University of Houston. Manny Navarro will join us in about 20 minutes or so. They both have committed to play at Miami. They get a couple of weapons. Yeah, those are two really good players. Uh, Sam Brown was really nice at Houston. I think that was a loss for the Cougars, but you got a coaching changeover, so you're going to lose some guys. And, and unfortunately, that was one of those for Willie Fritz. 
I think they'll be fine, but I do think that's a really nice get for Miami. And he was one that when he got in the portal originally, a lot of people were like, oh, shoot, uh, you know, Sam Brown. So um, that's that's a good one. Uh, but <laughs> certainly Damian Martinez, that was being hinted at and talked about late last week as a strong possibility. And so he makes it official. And I, I've raved about him plenty of times. I've, I've covered his whole college career or watched him and kept up with him his whole college career. He's a really nice player um, that definitely adds something to Miami. Now, I don't know if it adds wins in the big picture, but I think the combination of – uh, he and his new quarterback, uh, if they don't add wins, then I would start the coaching search immediately mm -hmm. um, because there really is no excuse if you've got Damian Martinez and Cam Ward in your backfield. Um, why that's, <clears throat> why if that's not adding a couple of wins to your uh, schedule. I, I don't know really exactly what Mario Cristobal can do that, that will, minus, you know, commandeering some dominant defense out of the blue or something like that. But uh, that certainly gives Miami a, a big spark that they didn't otherwise have. Well, if you look at, at their roster, it's very veteran laden right now. Uh, and that's what you need to win. Look, Cam Ward is a senior. Uh, he, he's, he's been a lot of places. Now they've got Damian Martinez officially in the fold. Uh, he has been a lot of places. Uh, I mean, a lot of plays. He's played a lot of games and made a lot of plays. Uh, the receivers now will be Sam Brown, uh, who's a veteran guy. Jacoby George, a really good player player and a senior and Xavier Restrepo the, the kind of classic I him yeah, yeah the classic Miami first down red zone mm -hmm. little no like I mean, he's not little but like you know annoying little he's a punk and he's not on your team yeah like yeah. the guy you just hate uh but if you're Miami he's perfect I mean he is yeah. so old school Miami and this makes them exciting again they're they're really good up front on both sides of the ball they've got good skill position they probably don't have as much depth as they'd want to have but at least this puts them in a position now where they're exciting again this is that's what you said in the text to us over yeah, the weekend. It makes yeah. them exciting. It makes them interesting I think that's the thing that not only Mario Cristobal but everybody between Larry Coker and him has been fighting was Miami used to be for better or for worse, the most interesting team ever. And then they just became another team, and it was Miami. It so happens. Everybody, this, yeah. yeah it, it, this even, makes them even, interesting, yeah. and, and I think it makes them exciting for other recruits to come in and see it, and I think it makes them a threat to other teams in the ACC. And they don't really recruit Texas hardly ever in the yeah. roundabout way they have. It wasn't in, like, straight out of high school, but now all of a sudden you look up and they got a few Texas kids on that roster where normally they – they don't, and if they do, it's a lineman or it's a defender. Um, they're just one of those – it's like LSU that uh, – LSU, more often than not, they've got a Texas kid It's on defense, um, and occasionally they'll have an offensive guy – um, like Josh Williams, I think, is probably the best. But, like, their receivers yeah. are all from Louisiana. Yeah. Their quarterbacks are from wherever. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just cool to see a, a little Texas flavor to Miami for a guy who pays attention to those sort of things. All right. Well, speaking of Miami, Ja'Curry Brown was a quarterback there. Remember? He left. Uh, this is his meal this over the weekend as he visited UCF. That is a tomahawk veal chop. And, of course, a lobster tail, along with all of the others at the uh, Capitol Grill in Orlando. That was over the weekend. Just a minute ago, I saw where he has committed to be a part of UCF going forward. Well, and a highly thought of prospect coming out, but uh, obviously didn't work out at Miami. Now he gets to go uh, play for, um, no offense to you, Shannon Dawson, but a better offensive coach. Uh, an offensive coordinator in, in Gus Malzahn and his staff there, and sit behind K.J. Jefferson, a guy with a very similar skill set and body type. And Gus is basically saying, look, if you're a six foot three or more quarterback with a big rocket arm that can move around a little bit, um, Cam Newton's uh, coach wants, you know, wants a word. So he's, he's kind of figured out. Uh, who he wants. Now, look, not to knock our good friend John Rice Pumley, who was... Uh, well, he was yeah, picked it, up, right? Picked up, yeah. Um, uh, but, like, you know, these guys could carry him around, like, in a little, like, papoose. With yeah. baby Bjorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just, I can't, I can't help but fear feel for the poor student athlete when I see the size of that steak and uh, how street <laughs> no I, yeah, I know it's different for football that's recruits the one I've ever I know seen it's different for football recruits but that's some of the stuff that yeah. like Put that just up totally again, gets freaking ignored like you, you know the the street agents like 
I, not, not everybody's Ja'Cory Brown getting, you know, wined and dined to, to come play football there. But, like, that's the stuff that we just act like is not even, like, part of the equation, you know. Um, but, yeah, they well taken care of on that trip to Orlando for, for certain. And a really nice pickup for uh, UCF, I think. Obviously, you've got your guy in K.J. Jefferson. But to set yourself up for beyond that or if he were to get hurt, God forbid – um, you've got a really dynamic, talented player who clearly people feel like has got something that he just hasn't been able to quite fully show yet for whatever reason. And so uh, Gus Malzahn, if anybody should be able to get that out of him here over the next uh, couple seasons, and we'll see what they can do with a guy who's obviously a you know, very talented young man. But yeah, it's the K.J. Jefferson show to start off with, and uh, you weren't expecting Corey Brown to come rolling in and, and start right away. So I think this works out well for everybody involved, uh, from UCF to uh, to Brown, and uh, we'll see, you know, obviously down the line uh, how much action he gets eventually, but I think on paper it's a really nice get. All right, so this story, uh, I, I did there's just wanted to read it, not the whole thing, but KSR Radio, which covers Kentucky, we got to know them during the Scott Drew uh, coaching search, or at least that carousel for them. Penny Boone, heck of a player, running back from Louisville was going to, uh, it looked like Kentucky was the place. However, KSR over the weekend reporting that Boone will not transfer to Kentucky. Players now have the green light to transfer as many times. We know that. However, they still must meet certain academic requirements to become eligible at their next school, and apparently that's a, an issue with Kentucky. So where's he at now? He's at UCF. He's visiting UCF right now. Not sure about how the transfer credits and all that works out. But what I, I like, oh, yeah, there is education. And oh, there's there are classes academic and degrees and things, and things yeah, like that. Wow. You just can't just go from one school to the but, next without going to class and obtaining more credits. And I'm sure that we'll talk about Dion and, and well, uh, Max Olson's column here eventually. But what he did say was have a plan. Penny Boone didn't look like he had a plan here in that – Here's the thing, like you want to transfer, that's all well and good, but you have to like, in the middle of the semester, semester you have to have transferable credits, you got to make sure all that's right. And I don't think like, as we push the, you know, the student athlete part into a lowercase student and uppercase athlete, more and more, I don't think it's a large price to pay to just make sure that whatever classes you are taking at the university, that you are transferable when you go to other places if you want to hop around. And look, this sometimes this is an oversight on an administrator's part or whatever, but these are things you have to uh, look through. And look, if Penny Boone winds up at UCF, that's another boon for a recruiting a transfer class that might wind up having Cormani McLean. Apparently, yeah. like that's one of the schools who's actually reached out to him so far they're very um uh, they've been done very very well in the portal this offseason so if he winds up at ucf good more power to ucf but still a little bit of a um you know a snafu on his part should have just stuck with louisville maybe but yeah. then we know the story there is that apparently he wasn't running with the ones and um you know that was part of the reason to go back into the portal i think anytime you see a guy enter the portal and not even play it down or make it through the spring with the team he just committed to that's a red flag I, maybe it's the school's fault on occasion but i just think in general that's a red flag so to see him go in go out um you know in a short amount of time like that it's like what the heck's going on here um and you know now the uh the uh, issue with the, the grade work, yeah, I'm not surprised because it just sounds like it was sort of a rushed and sort of mangled decision to begin with um, and, and perhaps not the most well thought out. So uh, I guess Louisville threw him for a loop, and, and now he's trying to recover, and uh, obviously it's just not as simple as, hey, I'm in the portal and I'm going to go here because mm -hmm. he can't go to Kentucky. So uh, that would have been a nice land for the Wildcats. Um, and I'm sure he would have loved to have gone and played in the SEC, but alas, that is not in the cards for him anymore. So, yeah, maybe a, a warning tale for others who attempt to do similar uh, in regards to how they transfer um, and over the course of a, a particular semester, uh, as, as he did, uh, you need to double check that all that's actually doable and not going to create a problem like your grades not being able to allow you to go to where you actually want to go. So, yeah, uh, let that be a lesson for everybody out there. And if he lands at UCF, uh, that would just add on, like y'all said, to the Knights having a really nice offseason haul. And you wonder, those who are handling the agents, who are handling the college players, are they more focused in on the NIL part of it or are enough of them also understanding 
you still need to make progress towards a degree. And honestly, I'm not really sure that's still the case. It, it's an example here with Penny Boone. You wonder about with all the transfers, is that still the case? You hope the compliance at every school is doing their job. Well, if an agent was the one to get in his ear and tell him to leave Louisville, hopefully he's got a new agent by now um, because whoever that was completely screwed the pooch. Uh, maybe in the long run they don't care because they got their money or he got his money and that's all they were after. But, yeah, you chase money. It doesn't always end the way that you want to. Um, as a matter of fact, it can go sideways more often than not. So I think this is uh, maybe one of those cases in the NIL era. And uh, there's others, of course, you know, of – I don't know if I'd call them, you know, horror tales or anything like that necessarily. Um, but this is one of those, like I said, one of those those uh, lessons to be learned for others that follow in Penny Boone's footsteps. All right. So the chat room is going. Hit the like.